Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 16th Sunday after Pentecost, September 17, 2023, are Genesis chapter 50, 15 through 21. The alternate first reading is Exodus chapter 14, 19 through 31. Psalm 103, optional verses 1 through 7. Then you have 8 through 13. We continue in Romans chapter 14, 1 through 12. And then Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. And anybody who took uh, Caroline's suggestion, or I think it was maybe Matt's suggestion, um, we in all like, the title, yeah. <laughs> of Who Are You Wearing? Um, these texts are basically calling us in Matthew to recognize that what God has done for us by the transformation of the Holy Spirit, we should be doing for others as a testimony to God's grace. So our behavior, what we're wearing, (laughs) is actually this generosity, and it's described right here um, uh, in in this this parable that um, you've experienced grace, and then you go out and do just the opposite. Well, that's the hypocrisy that so many people see in the church. Yeah. It's you say God has done a good thing for you, and we, we talked about this uh, over the last couple of weeks, that, but people haven't seen that in the church. And this parable, this parable is a, is a way to let the text do the heavy lifting in describing that hypocrisy. So dive in deep with Jesus here. And then if you, if you, if you decided to preach, who are you wearing? Just point people back to being what you preached about last week. Good. The you know the passage is um, well, well the parable is is kind of delightful that somebody owes ten thousand talents, uh, but then it ends horribly. You know, the the punishment meted out on on this person. So there it, it is a story about hypocrisy and about not being who you are. It also the, I. Th- it's also a great opportunity to talk about forgiveness, like what it is and why it's so difficult. Um, yeah. I think most people know they've got something in their life. They realize forgiveness is never a one-time thing. It's something you often have to continue to do over and over again, as you recognize new pain, uh, new resentment, new, new whatever. So to spend some time dwelling on that, but never to let people off the hook. I mean, I think you say forgiveness is hard. Some things we don't know if we can ever forgive, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes other people don't want to be forgiven. There's all sorts of things that, compl- that complicate forgiveness. But at the same time, I want to keep going back to this is one of the things that the church does <laughs> or talks about that very few other sectors in our society talk about. Obviously, in the synagogue, it's a big deal. Read Psalm 103, other religious traditions too. But there's something so counterintuitive about forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to say it's worse now than it's ever been, because I think people always say that. But there are not a lot of, of, of places where I hear the, about the power of forgiveness in society. Sometimes a good film or a good novel can can open that up. But... This is one of the things the church can still do really well if we commit ourselves to it, is just to display or to trumpet, you know, the power of forgiveness, to set one's oneself free of of things that continue to haunt us, but also to make communities that do more than just function but actually thrive. And again, I don't want to. I don't want to. Be heard as if I'm saying you have to force people to forgive because it's hard. And we need pastors who acknowledge, preachers that acknowledge it's really, really hard. Um, and we need help learning how to do it. I, yeah, I, I agree with that. And it, and as you were saying, Joy, it's, it's again, what it's what, you know, what are you, what, well, who are you wearing? But that it's a, it's a behavior. 
it's a characteristic of Christian community uh, that of forgiveness and how and how is it that we maybe even take that as a responsibility of the church uh, to to model what forgiveness looks like when when so much of what gets worn. <laughs> to continue that in our culture is uh, revenge, spite, uh, all, you know, all the opposites of forgiveness. And so it, but, it, but as you said, Matt, to, to really complicate it and to say that this is, and, the, and, and that's really what the opening, uh, opening verses give, give witness to, right. That it's, it it would if it would be easy if I you know if if I only have to forgive once, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, and so those opening verses really are you know as many as seven times you know Peter wanting to qualify or quantify and make it easy right in some way then make it be a simple formula uh, to that this is this is okay how many times and then I'm done <laughs> and and it's not that way and. And so it, and so the extravagance of the seventy-seven times, and the commentary talks about this as well, right? That it's not this unlimited forgiveness, this compassionate mercy, uh, this uh, this way of of being in the world that has this uh, mark of forgiveness as part of who we are. Is it's so it's not it's uh it's not like a one time thing right it's like a it's almost like a way of being um yes. where is it where is it that i'm holding on to something or holding on to kind of uh something that i need to let go when it comes to someone and and how much of our tendency is is that holding on and and not letting not letting go so there's um uh, and I know I've mentioned this before because uh, there are there are a couple of historical examples of incredible forgiveness, and we have a few in the more recent, uh, like the response after uh, the um, uh, Emmanuel Nine shooting and the family's uh, offering of uh, of forgiveness in that. Um, but uh, historically, the um, response uh, of the French Huguenots. Um, and when they were interviewed and asked, why were you protecting the Jews during the season of Nazi po power? They didn't understand the question. They didn't understand the question because they had practiced forgiveness so much and hospitality so much that it was a way of life that they could do nothing else. And I think that's the extravagance here. We saw it again uh, at uh, um, uh, when uh, the Amish uh, school shooting uh, in, in Nichols Mind uh, in uh, Lancaster County, where immediately the community forgave. And again, it was that same sense of this has been their practice that they didn't have to think about it. And the challenge for us, as it is for Peter in this moment, as Peter says, okay, look, this is going to sound big, but like, do I got to do it seven times? <laughs> I, I, I I think he's asking that as a big number. Yeah, right. And then right. Jesus makes it an extravagant number because by the time that you've done it over and over and over again, it is truly a way of life. And if if I may, and 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 you can you can pull me back, but if if we shift that to Joseph, the Genesis, um, yeah. the Genesis mm -hmm. text, forgiveness, and and people say this all the time, forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean you return to a relationship. So so, so sometimes forgiveness is so that you can stop crying so that you can stop carrying this burden, so that the harm that you are needing to forgive isn't continually being upon you as you remember and hold that memory. So forgiveness can be an act for you without restoring the relationship. And I think that's what we read here. 
is that, okay, our dad's dead now. Joseph seemed to be pretty cool when daddy was alive, but we got to put some things in place because forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean reconciliation. And yet here in this Genesis story, it does. And that's why I said, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are transformed to make this act of forgiveness a practice of reconciliation. It's not one smooth move. It's the journey we're on. Be patient with yourselves. Good. Psalm 103, also great for talking about this as a, as a characteristic of God that, um, which, you know, I, I, all of our traditions make that a part of our regular worship. And um, the psalm can help us stop for a second and slow down just a little bit and, and spend some time on the, on the magnitude of God's forgiveness. It makes me think, too, of, uh, and we've suggested this before, I've suggested this before, uh, that if if this becomes, you know, the focus, you are focusing on forgiveness, that you, if you have the option uh, to play a little bit with your liturgical ordering, <laughs> and rather than have your confession and forgiveness, if that's part of your tradition, and your uh, your liturgical uh, tradition, rather than having it as it is often in mind um, at the beginning of the service, have it after the sermon, so that you so that the congregation doesn't just think about forgiveness and but asks for forgiveness um, from God and does forgiveness. And you might even you might even think about using some of the words of the psalm in a in a creative rewriting of the confession and forgiveness or some of the words of the texts uh, to, to, so that people kind of going back to what you were saying, Joy, that people, that it doesn't, this is not a cognitive thing or it's like a, not a one time as Peter wants it. Right. But it's a practice. It's a way of being, it's a way of being a Christian. And, and so, yeah, so that, so that people can actually feel that and, uh, uh, or you could even do it in the middle of the sermon or something like that. I don't know. But I think there, I hope that maybe, I hope that preachers can do something like that so that you're, so that that liturgical response uh, is, has that kind of effect when you're. I think, I think that word is, is key. Um, it, it's so that it becomes a response. So uh, if, 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 if you're working with the Matthew text, um, the response to being blessed by God is to be a blessing. The response of being forgiven by God is to forgive. forgive and yeah. um, so, so the the words here um, uh, in the in the optional portion, bless the Lord, O my soul. Um, are we blessing God, or are we asking to be blessed? And, and since we have been blessed, we've been forgiven, then how do we bless God? How do we respond to that? And that would be the Matthew text. Um, you've, been, you've received this forgiveness, offer this forgiveness. And then liturgically, this would be our confession and receiving as a response. But I also think that this psalm is written in parallel to the Exodus events. So that, you know, again, we have this, um, um, the uh, angel has gone out, the, the angel has um, um, led before them. And in this context, there's extreme grace. And um, how do we offer that extreme grace? Because we can read this um this exodus and just languish in the extreme judgment. But uh, as as uh, I think Matt brought up last week, um, there's a patience in God before we get to this judgment. And and so if if you focused on that last week, here's that scene that uh, what Matt called spectacular scene. Um, but it is it is in the midst of 
extreme offering of grace. And, and I think we can use that psalm in, in the midst of there too. I want to say one more quick thing about forgiveness, if I, if I can. And um, especially if, if a, the preacher is, is trying to complicate these things or at least acknowledge the difficulty of it. And to point out that the Bible has multiple ways of talking about sin and forgiveness and a wide range of vocabulary, especially for, for sin. But the, um, the, the concepts are, are not exactly the same in Matthew as they are like in Psalm 103 or in Psalm 103, it's sin is something that has to be removed from me, has to be separate. You know what I mean? Then the, you think of the scapegoat uh, hmm. tradition, right? This is something that's got to be taken out of the community and driven away. Mm-hmm. In Matthew, you've got more of a sense of a debt that has to be paid off, right? And so the, mm-hmm. the financial illustration, I guess, of, of sin and forgiveness as, as paying off of a debt and just to point out that all of those ways of the, the Bible conceives of what happens when sin is forgiven, I don't think anyone can carry the day. Yeah, yeah. There's mm-hmm. a variety of them. And some of that has to do with ch- culture and how culture change and how Israel interacts with its neighbors. But it also, I think, bears witness to how hard forgiveness is and the various ways that our soul can get wrapped up in, in the wrongs that we suffer, the wrongs that we commit. And we realize the the depths of this, and that it's never quite as easy as writing a check to make everything okay, or uh, things like that. And so, just which I think is life giving when people hear that, when like, oh, it's not just me. <laughs> I'm not just a monster because I still can't get over what X did to me, and and so on. But um, but I think there's an acknowledgement here that that sin is so deeply woven into and so embedded into our own lives, our own ways of perceiving ourselves and reality and our relationships and our communities, that there is no, no simple fix, no simple way of understanding it. Well, and the, the, and I, that reminds me of the commentary on Genesis, the Genesis text, where is, you know, we see this as, as forgiveness, but there's some ambiguity there with regard to Joseph's response. Exactly. Exactly. And so, so that's another that's another thing too. It it, it I uh, I think too of the some of the sermons beginning sermons I hear often on the prodigal son, and uh, that you know that the prodigal son is um, at the end of the day forgiven and um, um, it repents and is forgiven and uh, and I I think it's in part our human desire to want to see. And experience forgiveness, and I'll almost wish it into a lot of texts. <laughs> this must be forgiveness, and I think that just underscores what you were saying, Matt. That it's just complicated, you know. What what does what is what does forgiveness look like, and 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 where is it, and what does it feel like, and so yeah, it's another way to think. And then joy, it. joy opened the door. You, you opened the door so nicely to Exodus as well. That I mean. To, Again, to get to the question of, well, who is God in this, you know, that uh, the, the God at the end of Matthew's parable is a little frightening to me. <laughs> uh, the God of the Exodus, of course, is terrifying, especially if you're, if you're Egyptian. Egyptian. Um, and so it's, it's one of these stories you have to sit with for a bit and, and recognize there are clear <laughs> there's a there's a clear good team and a clear bad team here, and some of that is is theological in terms of how Pharaoh is is wrapped up as a as a deity in human flesh almost. And um, most people probably know this story too. There's a rabbinic story about the heavenly host all celebrating at the Exodus, and God silences them and says, "Those are my children drowning in the sea as well." That, That's right. Um, yeah, it's obviously not part of the biblical text, but it's it's what happens when people of faith sit with this text and wonder how do you how do you square the this marvelous deliverance with you know the violence done to people who who knows how they got into Pharaoh's army, right? <laughs> um, right. And so, where is the where is what does the goodness of God look like in these moral dilemmas where you know? somebody's back's got to get broken, right? Pharaoh's back has to get broken for the Hebrews to get free. He's not going to be negotiated with, but who suffers as a result of those decisions? 
made by powerful people in comfortable mm-hmm. places. Mm-hmm. And again, the the text from uh, Ezekiel, I think it was that from last week, that God does not desire for the destruction even of the wicked. Yeah, so that rabbinic story embodies that, yeah. Well, and we even have, there's inklings of this in the Romans. So this is the last Romans text. Last one. Yeah, so yeah, uh, if you've been working through Romans, this is your, yeah, this is your last one. Uh, and, you know, there's a couple other chapters after 14, so you might want to, Bring in a little bit of that if you want, but yeah, then we move to uh, Philippians. So uh, we've we've worked through we've uh, we've worked through Romans, and uh, but you do have some of that in terms of of passing judgment, and um, and it's a kind of an odd text to end on with Romans. If I'm if I'm totally honest, yeah, you can <laughs> cheat though. You could add like fifteen verse one or fifteen verse seven if you wanted yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it needs a little more. I would do. (laughs) I would preach on Romans 16 in a couple of weeks too, but. I would go back and do that. Yes. I'm weird that way. Yeah. Why do you think it's a weird text to end on? Well, in part because uh, there's two good chapters coming up and (laughs) (laughs) Um, I, I, and part of me, I, I really like the first verses of 16 where it's an opportunity for a preacher to note the many women that are com- that were uh, so critical in Paul's ministry, and um, in addition to Phoebe, the other names there in the list. And so, yeah, it's it's it you know Paul's even Paul's this letter, this magnum opus, if you want to call it, uh, to the Romans. Paul, you know, none of what Paul does is on his own. It's it's uh, with this accompanying uh, accompanying of all these other um, apostles and people, and uh, and so that's that seems like a um, a very lovely ending to Romans, to, especially to preach to a congregation, right? I'm going to plug a book that's here. Just I'm going to mm-hmm. plug a book here. If 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 your curiosity has been raised to go to Romans 16. Uh, Nijay Gupta's book, Tell Her Story, does a wonderful job of talking about uh, the role of women in scripture and um, and particularly taking note of uh, how um, how Paul is so attentive to women in, in Romans chapter 16. Uh, so I, I throw that out there. Yeah. But the other, I mean, you know, that so each then is uh, each of us will be accountable to God. And so that Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a way that I that's a line, I think, that you can connect with some of the conversations that we've had so far. So that's maybe how I would bring it in. But that's going to be news to a lot of people. What? Each of us is going to be accountable to God. Yeah. (laughs) Like each of us in the church. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry. I think I know some people who assume they're not. But um (laughs) I mean, it's 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 a the the topic here seems weird about who gets to eat meat or who wants to eat meat and why and why not. It sounds yeah kind of like this quaint ancient debate, and so you know, preachers got to talk about where did meat come from in the ancient world? Where was it sold? Yeah, who was able to buy it? Why was it bought? What are the issues at stake here? But to also just highlight, um it was really hard work keeping these ancient Christian communities together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it was really hard work and we get glimpses of that in the epistles, but you can imagine this. You can imagine people who are like, you know, we've always why should done I care it what you way? think? What's that? We've always done it this way or we've well, never that, done it like that. Or I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a free man. You're enslaved. I, well, well, I don't care about yeah. your conscience. Yeah. You know what I mean? The way in which Roman society gave its privileges to certain folks and and all of a sudden these people are together and like you I still I know you still worship Dionysus on the weekend. I talked to your friends. I mean that you know, it wasn't like this was all simple and everybody was in harmony and they had a tradition to follow and all that. They're just working it out as they go. And and Paul's like, Yeah. <laughs> That's there in the Greek. Yeah, you know, like, how do you 
how do you promote the freedom that Paul clearly thinks is ours in Christ, but recognizes we got, we got work to do. Exactly. Which is why I think verse chapter 15, verses one and seven are so important. That's finally about this mutual welcome, like just hold together. <laughs> Can you just hold together for the time being? It will make it all so much easier. Um, but that's anybody who spent five minutes in a church knows how difficult that is even today. And, and, and as I've said, you know, uh, throughout all of this, this is where Paul is going with this, this, this letter, you know, um, I'm, I, you, if you haven't figured it out, I get into a conversation and I talk myself into saying something, but with the letter, you have a theme, you have a reason that you're making this correspondence, you know, where you're going. And so uh, Paul knows where he's going with this letter, and this is it. Everything that Paul has been doing all along is to make this statement uh, or, or to underscore this statement that what this is about is unity among these very diverse um, caste and class that are now coming together in the name of Jesus. And, uh, and as you've said, Matt, this is hard work. It's hard work because We've not been together before. This group of people has not been with that group of people. It's hard work because our practices are different. It's hard work because the culture around us is totally the opposite. The culture around us is what we've been practicing. And now we're having to go back and figure out what is true hospitality? What does it mean? And I'm gonna speak as a Wesleyan here to practice the holiness of the good God. And that's hard work.